and that's Marty's The Hammerhead Sharks Epic Adventure. Did you enjoy that, Dr. Dolphin? Dr. Dolphin and her uh, mask. So welcome everyone. Welcome to the UNC Virtual Science Expo. My name is Tamara Poles and this is Dr. Dolphin who is best friends with Marty the Hammerhead Shark. Dr. Dolphin wants to be a marine biologist. So what's really cool is that we have a marine biologist online now not do named Dr. Alex Hearn and he will be talking about Marty the ha Hammerhead Shark and what he's up to in his research in the Galapagos. And what is really cool is that we have three, count them, three featured classes here today. And they are Collettesville School, Meadowview Elementary School, and Iredell Charter School. So welcome featured classrooms. And if you're a featured classroom, please feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A box in uh, your Zoom window, or you can raise your hand and we will call on you. And if you are tuning in on YouTube and you have questions, please feel free to email us at ncsciFest at unc.edu and we will field those questions as well. So we are super excited today to be talking about sharks. Dr. Hearn studies sharks, how amazing. You're excited, I'm excited, we're all excited. Let's do this. So Dr. Alex Hearn, where are you right now? I'm in North Carolina, Chapel Hill, North Carolina to be exact, but where are you? Hi, well, I'm actually in Quito, which is the capital of Ecuador. Um, we work mostly in the Galapagos Islands, but with the pandemic and everything, um, I'm home in Quito at the moment. And uh, luckily we're slowly getting back into the field. So every so often I do get to get out there into, into the beautiful islands around Galapagos. I'm just taking my mask off because I'm on my own here. So um, I think I'm safe. <laughs> that is a great point. So I'm actually here with some techs, but we are all socially distanced and we've all been vaccinated. So. I too will take off my mask, but Dr. Dolphin, she's gonna keep hers on. She is not vaccinated yet. She's only has one of her shots. You know, so, I, wish, I wish I was in Galapagos because Galapagos are doing really well with their vaccinations, better than Quito, which is the capital of Ecuador. So maybe I should just take the next flight over there. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Just sneak on over. <laughs> I think you totally should do that. So, could you tell us a little bit about what you do uh, in the Galapagos or in Quito? Sure. Um, so uh, I'm a professor of, of marine biology at the University of San Francisco de Quito. And we have a campus here in Quito. This is our main campus. And we also have a campus with UNC Chapel Hill in, uh, in Galapagos, on San Cristobal, the capital of Galapagos. And they call it La Isla Bonita, the beautiful island, because she's amazing, that island. Um, and so a lot of the work that I do is trying to understand how marine reserves like the Galapagos Marine Reserve protect endangered species like sharks. And, um, and as part of that, it's important to get, to get that message across, not just to scientific audiences, but to the general public. Because at the end of the day, politicians have to make decisions. And if we're kind of giving them a push and showing we support those decisions, um, then it's easier for them to make them. And so one of the things that we do is we try to translate the science into kind of different means. And, and one of the things we did was this beautiful story called Marty the Hammerhead Shark. I see you have the English version. <laughs> we also have a Spanish version here um, because it's about communication, right? So we want this, this story to get out to audiences here in Ecuador, also Costa Rica, we'll come to that again in a minute, and to the general public around the globe. So it's important that we have this in several languages. That's amazing. That is very cool. So could you tell us a little bit about what Marty the Hammerhead Shark's about and what's going on with this book? Sure, okay, so what I thought I'd do today, um, I'm not gonna read the whole story to you guys because you can actually download this and read it yourselves. And I think you guys are a little older as well. So it might be more of a story for your younger siblings, but I think, because you guys are a little older, you might be interested to understand like the process, the science behind why we do these stories and, 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 and 
you know, what's the point, right? So if I, if I can share my screen, let's see, I should be able to do this by now after a year of teaching on Zoom. There we go. Okay. So what I thought I'd do is I'd go through little clips of the story um, and, and kind of explain to you, you know, why this scene is happening or not. Okay. So Marti la tiburon martillo is, means Marty the hammerhead shark. Um, she's a female. And again, we'll explain why that is. Um, so there's a lot of thought gone into how we design this story. And as you can see, she's out there. Um, there's certain iconic uh, views of Galapagos in the background. Darwin's Arch is a very famous dive site. A kicker rock is this rock here just off San Cristobal. And so we wanted to set the scene based in reality. Um, and just to step back a second, um, scalloped hammerhead sharks are one of several species of hammerheads. Um, so in fact, for some of you that maybe didn't know, there's over 500 different types of sharks on the planet. That's a lot of sharks. And sometimes some of the sharks kind of get all the media attention, right? Like the white sharks or, or what have you. So um, scalloped hammerhead sharks are the, are the ones that we have here. In fact, um, recently there was a new species of, of hammerhead shark discovered um, called the Carolina hammerhead shark. And the only place they know that it pups is in South Carolina. So it's kind of around your neck of the woods. And the thing is, it looks exactly like a scalloped hammerhead shark. So it's very hard to tell the difference, but it's been there all along. They only just figured it out. So we're still learning a lot about hammerhead sharks. But this particular species, the scalloped hammerhead, and they call it that because it has like a little notch in the front of the head, like a little scallop shape. Um, and this has populations, right? And, and the population in the Eastern Pacific is the population that we're studying because it's the one that's in Galapagos, Cocos, Malpelo, all these islands out in the Pacific. And um, it reaches a maximum size of just under three meters, mostly. That's a, that's a big shark, um, but it takes a long time for it to grow. So it, it doesn't become mature enough to reproduce until it's about 13 years old. Um, and it can live for up to 30 years. So these guys live a fair amount of time and they can reproduce every year. Um, it takes them 10 months um, to, to, to go all the way until they're ready to pup, um, a bit like humans. Uh, and then when they do pup, they give birth to maybe 15 to 30 pups at a time, which isn't really much if we think about other fish that just, you know, throw out several million eggs. And, and that's one of the reasons that sharks tend to be endangered. And in fact, just recently, um, this species was declared as critically endangered. Uh, and part of that is due to overfishing. Uh, and also there's a market for their fins. They've got nice big fins. Uh, and some people think that it's a good idea to eat, um, use their fins in, in soups, right? And so in fact, over 60% of uh, shark fins from, from hammerheads uh, in the Hong Kong markets come from this part of the world. So this is a big problem. Um, they're now critically endangered and they're on several international treaties to, 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 to protect them, right? Um, but clearly it hasn't been working until now. And so we thought it would be a really good idea to, to write this story, to start bringing home to people um, the importance of protecting their habitat, uh, okay? And this Martin the Hammerhead is a story for all ages. So here we have, I don't know if you recognize that lady there is uh, Sylvia Earle, her deepness. Um, she is an eminence uh, in ocean conservation, so we were very happy to present her with a copy. And then here's my kids uh, enjoying the first copy of Marty when it came out hot from the press a couple of years ago. Um, and, 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 but, you know, we could make many stories about hammerheads, and this particular one um, is about a migration. The movement of a hammerhead from Galapagos to Cocos Island, which is another beautiful oceanic island where there's lots of hammerheads. And, and we found that they moved back and forth. So the idea was that through this story, and I've written this in Spanish deliberately because you know this is all about both languages, is through the adventures of Marty and her friends to raise awareness about needing to protect you know, the marine ecosystem and the animals that live with it. So, so far, Marty has been, she's a, she's a traveler. Um, there was a pre-launch event in 2019 in the UK uh, over in England, uh, because this was done in, co in collaboration with a group called Galapagos Conservation Trust, and they're based in England. And they do a lot of work supporting myself and other researchers in protecting Galapagos. So this, this was a collaboration with them. Um, Marty hit the national press in Ecuador in June 2019. Then she met Sylvia Earle 
in Galapagos on a boat in, in November 2019, just the month before. Actually, this is our campus. You can see that. Can you imagine having a campus on the beach? We have a problem. Whenever I'm missing some students, all I do is I look out the window and there they are on the beach, surfing, snorkeling, playing with sea lions. I don't know if it was such a good idea about having a campus on the beach. Anyway, we did a launch on the beach in San Cristobal with some local kids and, and they made some puppet shows. Uh, and then in December, they, they, they presented us with their stories of the next adventures of Marty. Um, then in February, 2020, just before COVID hit, uh, Marty came to Quito and she was invited by the Ministry of Education and, and uh, we presented her to, a, to school kids. And then literally the week before school broke up, right down here, you can see we were presenting Marty in one of the schools locally, just by my university. And then, well, we all know what happened then. Everyone was stuck at home. So Marty took to the airwaves and she's been traveling the internet and Zoom meetings ever since. So uh, we've been really fortunate to be able to get her out and about at least virtually. And, but just to go back to where she, where she is and where we are. So this is a map. Of, uh, of well, you can see Central America down here, um, and this is South America, and this is this dot here is Galapagos, right? So we're right in the middle of all these crazy ocean currents that bring lots of different water temperatures and animals. So we have corals and penguins side by side. It's just this crazy biodiversity, and that is the area that we're trying to protect. And, but all those red dots, as you can see, Isla del Coco, that's Cocos Island. Malpelo, all these red dots are UNESCO World Heritage Sites. That means that they are so valuable in terms of their wildlife that the whole world has decided to you know, mark them out for special protection. And so we're lucky here in Ecuador that we are the stewards of Galapagos and in Costa Rica, they are the stewards of Cocos Island. And as you can see, there's a fair distance between them, like 400 miles, that's, that's a long way. And what we found in this region, this is just a different kind of map, is that this hammerhead shark is found kind of all, a little bit all over the place, but it concentrates in certain areas. So if you can see these white hashed areas at Galapagos, Cocos, and Malpelo, they call it the golden triangle for hammerheads. That's where the adults are, those big schools that you may have seen in documentary. And then along the coastline, these red areas is where we know that there are baby hammerheads. So for many years, we thought that our hammerheads would migrate to these lagoons in, in, in coastal Central America to pup. And then, just in about 2017, I think it was, our friends in the Galapagos National Park Service discovered some baby hammerheads by accident. And at the same time, my team of students who were working on black tip sharks, we had a problem with our nets, so we had to change the nets for a day. And we caught some hammerheads too, almost at the same time. And we started figuring out, maybe we have baby hammerheads here as well. We just weren't using the right equipment to catch them. And since then, we've realized that Galapagos is far more important for babies than we thought. So, and just to, to, to back up, so I'm a marine biologist, I'm actually a fisheries, um, biologist and by trade and I studied crabs and lobsters in, in the Orkney Islands in Scotland. So when I came to Galapagos 20 years ago, I actually came for six months uh, to work on lobster fishing and sea cucumber fishing. And 20 years later, here I am working on sharks. So you, your, your career never works out how, how you imagine. And a lot of the work I do now is tagging, right? So um, just here on the right, you can see a photo of uh, um, there's me and my friends uh, out on a little boat. We've just caught a shark. We're attaching a tag to its fin. You can see Darwin's arch in the background here. And uh, once we fit the tag on the fin, we're going to let her go. Okay. And then some of the other things we do is we put these little tags inside them, and then they can be detected on receivers that we bump, uh, put down in the water, like this, this one here. So when the shark swims by, it sends it out a ping, and we can receive it. So that's the kind of technology that we're using to, to study sharks. And the reason we're doing it is because we want to know, are our marine reserves big enough? Are they the right shape, the right size? Are we really helping shark populations? And I think you probably know already, if you remember from the first slide, if they've just been declared critically endangered and we've had a marine reserve here for 20 years, maybe things aren't going quite as we expected or hoped. But anyway, let's get back to Marty. Um, Marty's story starts in La Isla Bonita, San Cristobal. And this, this is Kikarok. This is the 
best dive and snorkel sites at the island. It's about 40 minutes from town, and it's just opposite the area where we discovered the baby Hannah heads. So the story starts like this. Early one January morning, the Galapagos sun rises. Rays of sparkling sunlight shine through the mangrove lagoons of San Cristobal Island. Creatures appear from hideaways where they spent the long night avoiding predators. Colorful Sally Lightfoot crabs skip along the water's edge and shoals of small fish dart between the roots. An eagle ray drifts slowly by. Suddenly, a gray shape speeds past in a cloud of dust, chasing a tasty squid. It swiftly turns its hammer-shaped head, swallowing with a squid hole, its last meal until twilight returns. The gray shape is a young, a young shark, a scalloped hammerhead pup called Marty. The safe lagoons have been her home for nearly four years. They protect her from the predators and the strong ocean currents out at sea. Marty knows every part of them. So that's actually a photo here of the first baby shark we ever caught. And what a cutie, and it was a female. Um, and what we found is that, you know, once we started catching them with this new kind of net, we kind of encircle the beach and then drag it in so they don't get tangled, they just kind of get corralled in. We, we started catching them every time and we realized that they were really small. You can even see in the scar of the umbilical cord, which means that they've literally just been born. They're less than 50 centimeters long. And the first thing we did when we, when, we, when we started catching them is that we placed a little tag on one of them that sends out a ping and we have a hydrophone so we can listen, so we can track that animal. And we tracked that animal for, for three hours. It was nighttime, it was getting late and, and, and she moved around the bay. Um, and then we came back three days later and tracked her a little more and she was in the middle of the bay. Um, and so what we realized is that at nighttime, they tend to be along the edges of the bay and so if you set your net on the beach just before dawn, that's when you might catch them. In the daytime, what we found is that they move into deeper water, okay? And so this is the picture of the track. So this is our beautiful bay down here. You can see this is the map of the island. That red spot is where the bay is. That's the first one we tracked. See, with a beautiful blue eye there. Um, and this is the beach. So we hang around on that beach. We set a net. Uh, and then, you know, once we put the tag on the animal, we release her. And then see, she kind of moved around, checking out the bay, moved out of it, came back in. And then when we came back three days later, she was just hanging around in the middle of the bay. Behaviors in day and night. And we started, this is a real bay type of shark called the buck. Uh, and, and, and again, they're, they're pups, they're babies, right? And we started asking ourselves, well, you know, do these babies compete? Or do they have kind of different preferences for habitat? Um, and uh, so what we did is that we tagged a bunch of sharks. Here's one. Hey, Alex, you are a little bit uh, glitchy. You're breaking up just a little bit. So uh, when you come back, you might want to repeat what you said like a couple of, like, like at least a minute ago or two minutes ago. Because you're a little bit breaking up there. I'll tell you what. Um, we... Oh. Hopefully we didn't lose you, um, but you are frozen in a very nice position, um, as we all do when we freeze on Zoom. But uh, no worries. Uh, Alex is going to come back, and, and uh, I'm going to ask him some questions uh, that you guys have put into the chat, uh, into the Q&A box, and via email. So uh, don't worry. When he gets back, we'll uh, ask those questions. But he's probably going to sign off and sign back on. Oh, here's Alex. Alex, you back? I think I'm back. Yeah, something went wrong. I've turned my Wi-Fi off and on again. That, ten that tends to help. So awesome. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> oh, no worries. No worries. I was just letting them know when uh, when you come back, uh, you're going to like repeat what you said. And then when you finish, uh, I was going to field some questions from the Q&A and the chat box. But you can continue. Thanks so much. OK, I'm not sure where I dropped you, but I was probably showing you this set here, all those different numbers are different movements of different sharks. So what you do is you put a little tag on a shark like this video, I don't know if you can see, 
and then you just let her swim off and sit there. She's just swimming. She's just swimming around, right? So she just swims around with a little, um, with a little uh, uh, tag on her back. And then one of the other things um, we do as well, uh, let me check here. Alex, you're on mute. Okay, there we go. Can you can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah, okay. So what we started doing then is putting cameras down in the middle of the bay where we, we know they spend the time during the day and just see whether they swim past. And sure enough, this is the first camera we put down and within seconds, we got a baby hammerhead coming past. So we know they're there now and we know they grow to a certain size. I mean, that's that's not a newborn anymore. There we go again. All right. But eventually they get big enough that they can't stay in the nursery ground anymore, right? They need to catch some big squid offshore. They need to move to the adult grounds. And so we had Marty in the story leave her lagoon and move out to where the adults are. And here we have her leaving Kikarok behind. Marty begins her epic adventure. She passes Santa Cruz Island and tiny Pinta Island. A colossal sunfish glides through the water past her, and as it reaches the surface, it turns onto its side. Its flat body soaks up the sun's warm rays. Marty swims further and further until she reaches the top of the archipelago. So what we realize with our work is that there's a seasonal movement to the sharks as well. And up in the top of the archipelago, we find that sharks are there, the adults are there from June all the way through to February. And then there's a gap when they're, when they're, when they're not there. Uh, and what we found is that they're moving to Cocos Island. So we wanted to Marty to do that migration, to go up to the adult grounds in Darwin and then to move to Cocos Island. But before she does that, she makes some friends, right? So she finds a whale shark who's up at Darwin at the same time called Lucia. And Lucia has migrated between Galapagos and Cocos many times. And this time she's glad to have the young hammerhead shark pup as a kind of a, you know, as a chaperone to help her along the way. And as the last speck of land disappears over the horizon, a faint sound echoes through the water and a beautiful song swirls in the ocean currents. It's the song of the humpback whale. Males are calling from hundreds of miles away on their journey to warmer waters. The soothing sound follows Lucia and Marty as they move off away from Galapagos. And you'll notice here that Marty now has a tag on her, her fin, right? So she had an encounter with a researcher who put a tag on her fin, and those are the tags that allow us to track them so that we can understand their migratory routes. And in fact, whale sharks have those too. And as you can see here, these are some tracks. You can't even see Galapagos, it's such a mess in there, but these are all tracks of different whale sharks. And sometimes they go to Cocos like Lucia, and sometimes they go elsewhere. And this is just a photo of a whale shark with her tag on her fin. So what we do is we swim down and we just put the Put the tag on her on, on her fin and, and and we think they might be pregnant and so but in order to do that you have to figure it out right you can't just say well you know it's got a big tummy um so now we go diving uh, with a team from okinawa aquarium and they have an ultrasound so it can go down just like we use with, with human beings right and you can see you know the, the baby developing in the mom's tummy we're just the same with whale sharks so we're going down and we're seeing whether they're pregnant or, or not um, and so far, we haven't found any that are pregnant. Maybe they are just big, you know. But there comes a point where Lucia and, and, and Marty and their other friends, Tulio and, and Tico, uh, they get trapped in, in a net, in a person, a big fishing net that they use to catch tuna and that they close the bottom to, to take up the entire tuna school. Lucia's on the outside and she can see her friends that are trapped inside. And she powers her immense body through the water towards her friends. They're trapped. Bubbles of panic cloud the ocean. Terrified shoals of fish struggle against their net prison. Think slowly, Lucia tells herself. There must be a way out. She remembers. Her whale shark friends had tried to swim to the bottom of the net before it closed shut. Marty and Tulio must do the same. She begins to swim down, looking into the eyes of her terrified friends, encouraging them to move downwards, to copy her movements. Despite the panic and confusion, Marty spots Lucia at the other end of the net. She sees her swimming frantically towards the seabed, and she peers down. There's a gap. Of course, they must swim down. 
She turns to Tulio, but he's frozen with fear. Well, luckily, Tulio and, and, and Marty are able to escape. But I just wanted to show you, again, this is, this is from true stories. Here you see some pictures of whale sharks caught in those purse seine nets. Uh, and, and why do they do that? Well, tuna tend to swim along with whale sharks. Again, this friendship between the whale shark and the tuna, it's real. And so sometimes it's actually not it's actually not permitted anymore. But in past years, some fishermen used to look out for whale sharks. And if they saw a whale shark at the surface, they'd set their net all around it to catch all the tuna. But of course, then the whale shark kind of gets bashed around because it's, you know, bumpy with the waves and stuff. And, and it can do them a, a bit of damage. So luckily, this is not allowed anymore. So if it happens, then they're breaking the law, okay? The friends continue their journey towards Cocos Island. They've been lucky to escape, but they take care of Tulio because he's especially sad because he's lost his school. The tuna got caught. As they approach Isla del Coco, they cannot contain their excitement. A magnificent underwater world opens up in front of them. Brilliant and colorful corals sparkle in the crystal water. Huge schools of tropical fish swim next to silky sharks and hammerhead sharks. Some of those sharks are kind of swimming slowly on their side, chilling out, and they're showing their, their bellies to the other shark, to, to, to the reef fish that come and pick off the dead skin and the parasites. It's a kind of a spa. They get the full treatment here at Cocos Island, and these areas are called cleaning stations. They're really important for sharks. Some tiger sharks also are patrolling the reef silently, looking for some easy prey. So there you go. Again, this is some of the work we do. Sometimes we bring the sharks on board with, with a, um, in a sling um, and, and, and we put a tag on here. You can see a tag on the on this shark's uh, a dorsal fin. And every time that shark comes to the surface, it sends a signal to a satellite and we can track where it is, almost like a GPS. And here you can see this shark is about to be released because normally what we do is we cover their eyes with a wet cloth to, so that they're calm. And you, you can see it's got a tube in its mouth and we're pumping seawater because sharks do not like to be still. They need water flowing so they can breathe. So we make sure that we're pumping water through them and then eventually we'll remove the, the, the tail rope and the, and the, and the, and the pump and, and they can swim off and we start tracking them, okay? And these are the kind of movements we have. So you can see Galapagos in here. Sometimes they move around Darwin. This is down in San Cristobal down here where just before they become adults. When they move up to Darwin, and here you can see this movement along the swimway, right? This, is, this could have been Marty, this one here. Marty that went all the way to, to Cocos Island, although this one actually continued on. So you can start building a picture of where and how they move. And back in 2018, we finally proved, in fact, we really knew that beforehand, but in 2018, we, you know, the press finally got hold of this, and you know, the scientists proved that sharks travel between Galapagos and Cocos Island along an underwater swimway. And what we found is that it's not just hammerheads. Green turtles do it, leatherback turtles do it, whale sharks do it, silky sharks do it. A lot of all those animals are endangered animals and they're moving along this underwater chain of mountains, okay? So, and as you can see here on the map, you know, these are the Galapagos Islands, that's Cocos. You can see there's all these kind of underwater mountains and what we think they're doing is that they using those mountains to navigate, to give them that idea of direction. Right? And, they're, and they're probably not seeing them because they're quite deep, but they can detect the magnetic signal because these are all volcanics, so they've got a lot of iron in them. And so we think they're moving along these uh, chains of underwater mountains. And the idea is, well, can we protect them along these areas that we know they move along? And that's the conservation work that we're trying to do. Just to end up, this is a, a short video of the real Marty. Um, so for those of you who missed the beginning, well, you know, after we uh, released her and everything, this is Marty swimming around just off the beach in San Cristobal. Isn't she cute? How could anyone be afraid of something like that? Oh my goodness, that is adorable. <laughs> Just a few seconds, but I thought you have to see this. They are they are the cutest things on the world, aren't they? So anyway, I think that's pretty much 
it in terms of, ah, yes. So sometimes people ask me if I've ever been bitten by a shark. And the answer is yes. Um, and this is what happened. And I totally deserved it. So I didn't get bitten by a hammerhead shark. I got bitten by a baby black tip shark. And the reason was um, we took her out of the water to measure her and my hand was covering her mouth and she was uncomfortable. And so she bit me, bit my arm a hand. And so totally my fault, but I figure if you're going to be bitten by a shark, it's better than it's a shark this size than this size, right? So I, I live to tell a tale and I learned my lesson. So anyway, if you guys are interested in learning more about Marty, you can download the story and read it to yourselves or to your younger siblings. It's on, um, I think they're going to send you the, the links. She also has her own Facebook page. Um, and we even did a reading in Spanish that's on YouTube, if you like. So anyway, um, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to, to field them for you. Yay! Thank you so much, Alex. That was amazing. Me and Dr. Dolphin really enjoyed that presentation. And I think so did your viewers because we have a ton of questions in our chat and in the Q&A. So I'm going to ask one of the most common ones that I've seen in this chat and in the Q&A. And that is, what do hammerhead sharks eat and do they eat people? Right. No, hammerhead sharks don't don't eat people. There's a, there's very few sharks would be eating people, um, and and even that black tip shark, the, the baby black shark, she didn't want to eat me. She wanted me to let go, <laughs> so she was trying to get away. Um, no, hammerhead sharks. If you see, the mouth is quite small, and and really what they do, they they basically squid eaters, um, and that's why at nighttime, squid that are in the deep waters during the day, they come up at night, and that's when the hammerheads they leave you know, Darwin and Wolf and those islands, they go out into the open ocean to feed. And that's when they become vulnerable to fishing lines. That's really cool. I did not know that they ate squid. That's super cool. Thank you. There's another question in the chat. Do sharks breathe air? No, sharks breathe, um, get their oxygen through the water. And, and in fact, so there's two, I guess there's two ways of doing this, right? You can pump water through your gills, um, and some of the sharks that you sometimes see on the seabed can do that. But hammerhead sharks, um, they're ram ventilators. That means they have to be moving forward so that water is flowing through their gills. That means if they get entangled, the water's not flowing through their gills, so they'll suffocate. So that's why it's so important to protect these animals. It, 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 sometimes it's too late. If you release it from a net, you can have all the best intentions, but it's already suffocated. They need to have that water flowing. Wow, I didn't know that. So it ha the water has to be flowing in order for them to breathe. That's really cool. Um, how big do hammerhead sharks get? Well, this particular species, um, I think it's rare to see them over about eight to nine feet. Um, in the literature, maybe in the past years ago, they got much bigger, but about yeah, eight to nine feet, I would say. The great hammerhead, which is another species, can be much bigger than that. I can be you know, twice the size. Oh, wow, that's huge. So um, do hammerhead sharks like live peacefully with such as whale sharks and other other animals or do they not get along? They, they tend to mind they're in business. I mean, they, they, they will swim in these big schools. Um, sometimes you see them in smaller groups. Um, they don't like dolphins very much. Uh, when the dolphins come by and you hear them when you're diving, so they're a bit nervous of dolphins. So, you know, I think if we're going to we're going to introduce you guys. We're going to have to be, you know, gentle about it and get you guys used to each other. Um, okay. <laughs> but they're mostly, okay, um, yeah, they, they, they mostly don't bother um, and, and they're not bothered by other sharks. Okay. That is an awesome answer and it's okay, Dr. Dolphin. We'll, we'll, we're going to get there. Uh, we have some more questions from the chat. Um, do sharks lay eggs? Some sharks do. Um, and some sharks don't. Hammerhead sharks don't. They actually give birth to live young, about maybe 15 to 30 pups. Um, and, and a lot of these sharks, this kind of shark, will, will um, give birth to live young. The whale shark is a funny one. Um, the whale shark has eggs inside her, and the eggs hatch inside her, and then continue to develop, and then they're born. So it's like a hybrid. Um, and then there's other sharks that lay eggs and just kind of have them on the seabed. You see them, they're called mermaid purses. Oh, nice. I've actually seen mermaid purses before. That's really cool. That sounds like the yeah. best of both worlds, too. 
Um, so our hammerhead sharks, so there's, I'm going to combine a couple of questions that are both in the chat and in the Q and A. And it's more about the temperament of sharks. Like are sharks mean? Are there some sharks that are nicer than others? What's that like? I bet you dolphins are nicer. <laughs> so I, I, I don't think that we can um, use those kinds of uh, adjectives to describe sharks because they're not, they're not, um, I don't think that they're, they're thinking the same way that we are. They're doing what they do. <laughs> so they're just, they're just minding their own business. There are some sharks that are more social. Um, so hammerhead sharks will tend to gather in groups. Um, whale sharks are less social. Um, I mean, you see them together, but only because there's food, there's plankton there. So, you know, they're eating, but there tends to be less interaction. Um, so it's more of a question of whether they're social um, and whether they're aggressive or not. I've not... I, that, they're rarely curious. I think silky sharks are sometimes curious. They come up to you and check you out. Hammerheads are, are, are a little skittish. They don't like people. They're, I think they're afraid of us. And they've probably got a good reason to be. The, the amount of them that we pulled out of the ocean. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't use, you know, mean or, or anything like that for sharks. They're just, they're just doing what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And sometimes we get in the way. <laughs> And uh, speaking of which, um, we have quite a few questions about teeth, actually, with hammerheads. Okay. So how may, what's special about shark's teeth and hammerhead shark's teeth? And how many teeth do they have? Gosh, um, so different, I mean, the teeth of sharks are really cool because depending on the, the shape of the teeth, you can make some ideas about what they feed on, you know, so if they have kind of long pointy teeth it might be to grab stuff the tiger shark has serrated teeth on both sides so it can rip stuff really quickly um so you, it can tell you a little bit about what they feed on or what their strategy is um but the, the cool thing about shark teeth because it's so important because a lot of them are predators most of them are predators they really need their teeth and because they could have a prey that's kind of fighting off and their teeth can break off um, sometimes you find them you know on the beach and so they need to replace those teeth so, so sharks will have different rows of teeth that kind of slowly move forward. So they can lose teeth and replace them again and again and again throughout their lives. So I don't even know how many te teeth a shark gets through throughout the whole life, but it's, it's a good deal more than we do, hopefully. That is insane. So you're saying sharks can replace their teeth. So does that mean I can replace my teeth too and I can eat all the junk food I want? And if those teeth fall out, I just got another one coming in? If you were a shark, but if you were a shark eating junk food, you might get a, a bit of a stomach ache. Oh, that's, that's also <laughs> true. I might as well just keep with squid, right? <laughs> All right. I can do that. Um, also, awesome. So we have, I'm going to, we have like time for two more questions. And one question is how fast can sharks swim? I think, well, in like in general, what we like to say is that a, a cruise speed could be like a body length per second. And that allows you to scale between different sizes. Um, but they can do burst speeds that are pretty fast. Um, whale sharks tend to be slower, but you, you know, the funny thing about whale sharks, when we're diving at Darwin, the current can be ripping. And uh, you know, you're, you're trying to catch up with a whale shark and the bubbles are coming out, your regulator's coming out your mouth and the whale shark's just sitting there effortless. And it's going nowhere, but the current is ripping past. So they're strong, steady swimmers. Um, but they do have this burst speed. Some of the, uh, you know, the Makos, I think, are really, really fast, you know, 35 miles per hour or something. I don't know the exact numbers, but they, they can get to pretty high speeds for short periods. Wow, that is awesome. And I kind of fibbed there. I am going to add one more question because the chat blew up with this question. So what are sharks' eyes like? Are they like people eyes? Um, a little bit, but remember, you know, down in the, in the ocean, there's a couple of things. First of all, um, you might want to protect your eyes, which are quite sensitive, if you're a predator, because your eyes and your mouth are pretty close together. So if you're battling a prey that's kind of fighting, you don't want to, <laughs> you want to have some kind of protection. So, so they've got these goggles that come up. It's called a nictitating membrane, and they can come up and protect them when they feel threatened or when they're in a, when they're in a feeding frenzy or something like that. So, which, which is pretty cool. Um, and then the other thing they have is um, they have a way of like detecting light at low levels. And it's almost like the light passes through twice. So they get, so they get that extra amount of, 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 of vision because it, it gets murky the deeper you get, right? So 
um, their vision underwater would be better than ours, but they rely on other senses as well, especially smell, sound, and, uh, and the ampullae of Lorenzini, you know, these little electrical um, gel bags that detect electricity and magnetism. That's so awesome. I want that. <laughs> That's amazing. So the very last question, I think everybody would want to know on this call, since we're all aspiring marine biologists and we all want to be just like you because you are amazing. So if I or someone on this call wanted to be you when we grow up, what should we do? Well, I'm very lucky. Um, I didn't set out to study sharks. Um, I, I always wanted to be a marine biologist. Um, so I studied hard. I studied um, you know, biology, math, which I struggled with, um, but I kept, I kept at it. Um, geography as well, to understand how things change in different parts of the world. I went to university, I studied marine biology and oceanography, to understand how the oceans work. Um, but it's, it's, it's study, keep, you know, keep, your, keep your focus. And I was lucky as well. You know, when I finished studying, I went to Galapagos as a volunteer for six months, and here I am 20 years later. So make the most of your opportunities make contacts, make friends, uh, and study hard. And, you know, if, if there is a bit of luck, then leverage it. <laughs> <laughs> that is excellent advice. So you heard it here first. Uh, study hard, keep going, because if, even if math or a subject is hard, keep trying, you'll get it. And volunteer and take advantage of your resources, who you know, ask questions, and that's how you can be. Volunteering is really important uh, and, and getting and, and support, support your friends and they'll support you. And like, you're not in this alone. Uh, you end up building a community. Exactly, exactly. Thank you so much, Dr. Hearn. And a special thank you to our three featured classrooms, Cullettsville School, Meadowview Elementary School, and Iredell Charter School. Thank you so much for coming out. I hope you guys enjoyed uh, this session. And next up at four o'clock, if you are interested in receiving resources for um, ex uh, STEM accessibility for early childhood education, please stay tuned because uh, my co-host Jonathan Frederick will be leading that session. But thank you so much for joining and I hope you uh, have a great day and enjoy the NC Science Festival.